I'm talking today to Mandy Weiner, who is the author of Killing Kebble. The book is about the death of Brett Kebble, who goes from being a successful South African mining magnate to hiring a group of people to kill him. Mandy, what, what was the mining company or companies that, was the, that the Kebble family ran and how did they make their money? So the mining companies that Brett Kebble took control of were a series of mining companies, JCI, Rand Gold, and they are mining companies that are very entrenched in South Africa. They've been around for, for well over a hundred years. And they were set up by the Rand Lords in Johannesburg who really set up the mining industries on the reef, uh, the gold mining industries in, in South Africa. And after Brett Kebble died, uh, we learnt a lot more about the, the malfeasance that was going on and uh, the way that he was really just f stealing money and mm. uh, pocketing it. And, and there was this very complicated paper trail and uh, it, it, was, it was incredible, it was astonishing the way that, uh, that he had managed to structure the companies in such a way that uh, he effectively just gutted them. We'll come back to that, but here we have Brett Keeble, who was a, a thirty Keble, who was a thirty-year-old lawyer who managed a hostile takeover of Rangold and exploration. Uh, as somebody who'd never been in the mining industry, how how did he do this? Uh, well, I think that he was just brilliant. Everyone who I've spoken to, every account that I've heard about how he managed to to manoeuvre his way into the company has told me about how, how incredibly intelligent it was. And that was the way that many pe people spoke about Brett Kebble, the fact that he was such a brilliant businessman. He was the kind of person who was running seven different deals at one time. Apparently he had six boardrooms and there was a deal going down in every single one of them, plus another one that he had on the back burner. And that was the kind of businessman he was. He he lived, he breathed, uh, every deal that he did, he was always negotiating something. So it didn't surprise me at all that at the age of 30, uh, he managed a hostile takeover of, of a mining company. And what happened as he started courting various people within the ANC? Well, not too much detail is known about exactly how he managed to... Uh, maneuver his way into the ANC. We know that he was he was funding the party, he was funding many political parties in South Africa. He also found a way to to support many of the ANC Youth League members, these young political Turks who had uh, the, the, their future ahead of them, who are now coincidentally very senior in the ruling party. And what he would do was, he, we've heard stories about parties, lavish parties thrown mm. at his house, we've heard stories about homes, townhouses, uh, vehicles that were bought for these young politicians. And we also heard about how he nurtured them, how he coached them, how he told them what to say at, uh, at gatherings and that kind of thing. Of course, they've, they've all pretty much denied it. Mm. Um, but from the stories you hear, it certainly sounds as though uh, there was this largesse and, and he was very benevolent with his money. And was he sincere in his belief in empowerment or were these simply kickbacks for business advantage? Oh, it depends who you speak to, of course. Uh, if you speak to some people, they'll say that it, uh, he was just benevolent um, and that he, he had lots of uh, charities about how he, he had charities that were feeding underprivileged street children in the Alexander Township. You hear stories about uh, he had the art awards, which, uh, which he gave generously to. And then other people you speak to say it was purely for his own benefit. He only wanted those things to be done so that uh, his own legacy... Uh, could be benefited and he was only doing it so that he could have some kind of benefit to himself. And in terms of the business advantage, what, what were the things that he got out of giving that money away? Well, I think there was a lot of black economic empowerment deals that he was very central to, and he reinvented himself regularly. Um, and, and as a result of many of those economic empowerment deals, he did benefit financially, but he also benefited politically, because the the underlying uh, theme through, through many of his business deals, and, and also his downfall, is the political circumstances in which he found himself. And he believed that he was being targeted as part of a an inter-party faction, a factionary battle within the Between ANC. Mbeki and Zuma. Between Tabo Mbeki mm. and, and Jacob Zuma. Yeah. And he very much believed that he was central to that. And he believed that that's why he was targeted by the now defunct Scorpions. Yeah. Because he, you know, he had aligned himself with the, with the wrong group. And so how does a businessman like Brett Kebble get to meet a gangster like Glenn Agliotti? 
it's a fascinating story. Um, the way that Brett Kevill, this this captain of industry, this larger than life character, found himself going to the underworld to go and fetch his killer, effectively. Mm. And all of that, the door was opened through through John Stratton, who was one of the directors of JCR, and also by Glenn Agliotti, who who he had met, who was friends with Jackie Salibi, the National Police Commissioner. How do you meet a man like Glenn Agliotti? You know, well, he's not in Yellow Pages, is he? No, he's not in the Yellow Pages, but, but with Glenn Agliotti, it's all about who you know, and it's about building a network. And he came to Brett Kibble through through John Stratton. Hmm. And and that's how he met him. It, they developed a relationship. And I'm sure Agliotti saw the gap and he, he developed that relationship. And it was through through Clinton Nassif, his former hmm. head of security, that he met the three people who actually killed him, Mikey Schultz, Nigel McGurk and, and Cuppy Smith. Um, he never actually met them in person. Hmm. He didn't want that to happen. But that's how he was led to them. A and what this story is for me is is the nexus between politics, business, and organized crime. And it shows just how close in proximity a captain of industry can be to the police chief who can be to hired killers. And in a way, the mention of John Stratton sort of simply shifts the question, because who is this British naturalized figure? And how does he become involved with Brett Kevill? Because he seems to be the sort of the beginning of the downfall, but very little is known about him. Very little is known about him. He's never faced charges in South Africa. He's never been extradited from Australia, where he now resides, and, and he's very ill. But his shadow certainly loomed large over Dene Gliotti's murder trial, because for me, John Stratton was the conduit for Brett Kerbal to the underworld. He was effectively the puppet master um, behind this entire thing, or at least that's how he was he was painted. Mm. Um, of course, he's never defended himself in, in court. I tried to speak to him for the book, and uh, I got a lawyer's letter back. Um, so, so he is quite a, a, is a, he a mystical is he a, figure. Is he a businessman, or is he something else? That's, that's what's not clear. I think he is a businessman, but he's a businessman who knows how to do business particularly well in a very different kind of way. Um, I think that, that he, he certainly is a businessman, but he, he regularly pops up uh, in, in connection with a number of nefarious activities. Mm. Um, but he's never been convicted of anything. He's, he's never um, really been charged. With so anything. what sort of nefarious activities? Um, well, well, in this case in particular, mm. um, there have been questions about how he was involved with the malfeasance with, at the listed companies and mm. uh, how he was involved with, with that maladministration um, and, and that corruption there. But of course, he's never, he's never been charged with anything. So how do these two shady characters, Glenn Agliotti and, and John Stratton, take Brett Kebble to, in a sense, corrupting Jackie Salebi? How does that occur? Well, we heard a lot of that from, from Glenn Agliotti. He, he, more than Stratton, was the one who, who led Kebble to Jackie Salebi. And what Agliotti did was he sold access to the National Police Commissioner and the head of Interpol, Jackie Salibi. Mm. So he befriended Salibi. They had a corrupt relationship, which has been proven by the courts. And he went to the Kebbles and said, if you pay me a million dollars, mm. I'll ensure that you have access to the National Police Commissioner and he will do things for you. And at the time, Brett Kebble had quite a few issues with, with the tax man. He had issues with, with the corruption charges um, and, and that kind of thing. And what happened was... So his hope was that these would go away if he could find the right person. Exactly. His hope was that these would go away. And that's what happened, was that Jackie Salibi came to dinners with the Kevils. The Kevils went to meetings with senior policemen uh, who were under Jackie Salibi. And all of this was through Glenn Agliotti. And it, it's emerged in court about how... Jackie Salibi was wooed by Agliotti about how they had these meetings at coffee shops and brown envelopes stuffed with cash were slid across tables and boardrooms and how they bought suits together and ties and, and there was an exchange of UK intelligence documents in, in the shopping in, in the parking lot of, of a shopping centre. So we heard all of that detail, hmm. revelations that came out in court. And the trouble at the heart of this twisted tale is the thing you were referring to earlier, the money that was taken out of the companies that was never repaid. How is it possible to take that much money out of a listed companies without it being noticed? Well, I think it was only after Kevill died that we really realised the true scope of what was going on, how he had just pillaged these companies. And now that he's dead, there's very little that can be done about it. Um, but it's, it's alarming to, to know just exactly what went down. 
um, and, and how he was able to to get away with it. You know, in the end, he was just shifting paper, and 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 there was no money. Yes. A and the fact that he managed to get away from it for, for so long just shows how remarkably astute and calculating he must have been. And how much do you think went missing? What's the calculation? And, and was any of it ever recovered? I can't recall um, exactly. I think uh, the figure of 900 million yeah, rand it was, was about 900 out of three million companies. Rand. Yeah, yeah, out of three companies. Um, but we've never seen the, the full forensic report. Um, but, but certainly it was about 900 million, and, and that is just astonishing. And what was that money used for? Because if money goes missing, it has to arrive somewhere, doesn't it? Well, from you know, I, I'm I'm not a business journalist. Yeah. So for me, the the story that I covered mostly was about the murder. Mm. Uh, but in the process of writing the book, I did speak to many financial journalists who did cover it, mm. and everyone I spoke to said that he was fleecing the companies in order to finance another deal, mm. and that's what kept happening. It was it was this cycle of of you know fraud raising money, raising money yeah. to, to just fund another another fraud effectively mm. so it wasn't it wasn't to do with his lifestyle because he had a oh, it had to do with his lifestyle as well i mean yeah. if you speak to to his butler you hear stories about the cars and how he he moved house and forgot a safe full of rolexes and how yeah. he misplaced a porsche and how at breakfast there'd be 30 types of jam yeah. And people who saw him drop thousands of rand in one grocery shop just for lunch. Um, you know, there's, there's all these stories of excess yeah. and, and lavishness. And he had an art collection of some scale. Oh, he had a massive art collection. He was yeah. well known for, for his art collection. So who ultimately is to blame for the money that went missing? Was it Brett Keeble alone or were there others involved in the process? Oh, that also depends who, who you yeah. speak to. There's, everyone has a version yeah. about what happened. Um, and I'm not sure that we'll ever know the, the, the truth truth yeah. of, of what happened um, but no one's really ever been convicted or charged for any of it. How many of those who were in Kebbell's circle are now in power? Well I think the, the most prolific one would be Fakile Mbulula who's now the Minister of Sport, he was the ANC Youth League leader, he's, he's a candidate for the position of Secretary General in the ANC at the Mangaung Conference in, at the end of the year and, and he was always very close to, to Kebbell along with a, a number of others who, who perhaps aren't as politically involved anymore. But I think that Mbalula would certainly be the, the, most the most high prominent. profile, the most prominent. Yeah. Mandy, thanks for talking to me today. Pleasure.